Information, please. A new type of question and answer game. How many miles are there in a light year? Approximately 5,865,696,000,000. Amazing! Elementary. A friend of mine asked me, by what cognomen would you designate the Homo sapiens seminar I perceived in your escortage yesterday evening? Would you please tell me what he meant? He merely asked, who is that lady I saw you with last night? Amazing! Elementary. Yes, folks, during the next half hour, the public asks amazing questions, and a group of experts assembled here are supposed to make them elementary. We present tonight the first in a series of programs called Information, Please, a new type question and answer contest in which you, the very much quiz public, will quiz the professors. Yes, the worm turns, and now the experts will have to know the answers to your questions or else. Or else, you win five dollars. Now, here's how it's done. You send us questions and the correct answers. If our editors find them proper and fair, they will be presented to a panel board of experts for the first time during each broadcast. If your questions are used, you are entitled to $2 for each one and $5 additional if the board fails to answer your question correctly. Now, there are other rules governing this contest, but I'm going to let our master of ceremonies, Clifton Fadiman, give you that information. Mr. Fadiman, the book critic of the New Yorker magazine, has read thousands of books, so we figure he can handle even our quartet of mental giants. I want you to meet our intellectual Simon Legree, the Tuscanini of quiz, Clifton Fadiman. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Before I give you any more details regarding the rules of information, please... Let me tell you about the Board of Experts for tonight's broadcast. They face me. First, Bernard Jaffe, head of the Physical Science Department of Bushwick High School. Mr. Jaffe is author of a number of books of popular science, including Crucibles, Outposts of Science, which are two of the best known. Next, we have Mr. Marcus Duffield, day news editor of the Herald Tribune, and the last word on current events, politics, history, and so forth. You have several questions about and so forth for Mr. Duffield this evening. <laughs> Third, we have uh, Dr. Harry Overstreet, a genuine dyed-in-the-wool professor of philosophy at the College of the City of New York, and author of a great many books. Influencing Human Behavior is one that you may remember. And finally, we have Franklin P. Adams, known to millions, I wouldn't be exaggerating if I said thousand, <laughs> as uh, FPA, creator of the famous humorous column, The Conning Tower, which will shortly appear regularly in the New York Evening Post. Mr. Adams is an unbeatable authority on popular songs and batting averages. He admits it himself. Here they sit, these four towering intellects. On their faces is a look of confidence, <laughs> which I believe to be entirely false. <laughs> Now, folks, any education that you and I may pick up for the next half hour or so is all to the good. But beyond that, we're out simply to play this as a game and have some fun at it. Now about the board's part in this contest. We guarantee absolutely, and we mean absolutely, that the questions will be shot at them now for the first time without any previous warning. These questions will be addressed to the entire board. Any member wishing to answer them may raise his hand and do so or try to do so. If any member undertakes to answer a question, he must stand on his own. Other members of the board may not offer any assistance unless I ask for help. Now about the five dollars. The five dollar penalty for an expert's failure to answer a question completely will be paid out from a kitty of one hundred dollars set up for each broadcast. And to make sure that the board works hard on each question, it's understood that what is left of the one hundred dollar kitty, if any, after penalties are paid, goes to the board for refreshment, such as a fine, cool glass of milk and a cookie. <laughs> when you hear that cash register sound, let me hear that again, it sounds very good. That means $5 is actually being paid out to the lucky questioner, if he's here, or it will be sent to him if he is. Now, there are a number of people here in the studio waiting to address that question to the board. There are some questions we've received from out-of-town listeners, and these will be presented to the board by your master of ceremony. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we are ready for the first question. All set, Mr. Jaffe, Mr. Duffield, Dr. Overstreet, Mr. Adams. Here she comes. Morty Baumann of New York City will put the first question. Mr. Baumann. The following women are important figures in the present administration. Miss Frances Perkins, 
Mrs. Nellie Ross, and Mrs. J. Borden Harriman. Can you give the positions occupied by at least two of these women? Oh, just to be on the safe side, you see, we're starting off with a tribute to the ladies. I'll repeat that question to Mr. Bauman. The following women are important figures in the present administration. Miss Frances Perkins, Mrs. Nellie Ross, and Mrs. J. Borden Harriman. Can you name the positions occupied by at least two of them? Mr. Duffield's hand is up at once. Mr. Duffield. I believe I can, Mr. Fadiman. Yes. Uh, this is Nellie Taylor Ross, as director of the Mint. Uh, Madam Perkins is uh, secretary of, uh, of labor. And uh, Mrs. J. Borden Harriman is uh, chairman of the Women's Committee of the Democratic Party. Chairman of the Women's Committee of the Democratic Party is a new one on me. I have a list of here as minister to Norway. We'd better make up our mind. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think she is minister to Norway, and uh, unless there is something, some evidence to the contrary, we'll have to ring up $5, which goes to Mr. Morty Bauman of New York City. Mm. Two. Answer two out of three. Correct. Two out of three allows us to keep the $5 for that glass of milk, Mr. Dover. <laughs> Next one comes to us from the home of culture. And it guesses where that is. Boston, Massachusetts. Comes from Mr. George Smith. Correct the following line and name its author. And the line is, In the spring, a young man's fancy always turns to thoughts of love. Mr. Adams. In the spring, a young man's fancy likely turns to thoughts of love. Very, very neat. Very, very neat. Can you tell us... Uh, can you tell us, Mr. Adams, what is the source of that remark about love? That was written by Alfred Lord Tennyson. Well, see whether you know any more about it. And do you know in what poem it appears? I think I have him there. But he saved us from losing five dollars all the same. Loxley Hall. Very good indeed. <laughs> it sounds very much like a put-up job, but I assure you it's quite honest. Anyone who looks at Mr. Adams' face will know that he's quite, quite honest. <laughs> now, the next question uh, will be delivered, given to us, by Mr. Maxwell Garnett of New York. Mr. Garnett. Uh, why would it never be necessary for the man in the moon, if married to a chatterbox, to tell her to shut up? <laughs> That's a puzzler. I'm going to repeat it, see whether I understand it myself. <laughs> why would it never be necessary for the man in the moon... It's married to a chatterbox to tell her to shut up. Now, well, that happens to be an easy one. Oh, Mr. Jaffe, the scientist. <laughs> there is no atmosphere on the moon, and it requires air to transmit sound waves. Therefore, she can talk from today until doomsday, and nobody will hear her. Nevertheless, I've looking over that question. It seems to me there's a catch in it. Because a real chatterbox on the moon would be able to create enough hot air of her own to allow uh, her own atmosphere, don't you think? That's a rather weak science there, Mr. Fadiman. It's the best I can do to see, Mr. Jaffe. The next uh, question comes to us from Miss Vera Chiruti of New York City. She's going to ask the question herself. Miss Chiruti. Uh, in what well-known symphony did the composer include a chord in order to awaken a sleeping audience? That's one for musicians. I'll repeat that one. In what well-known symphony did the composer include a chord in order to awaken a sleeping audience? Mr. Adam. <clears throat> the Surprise Symphony. Well, that's a surprise answer. <laughs> Correct, too. Who wrote it? <laughs> Haydn. Very good, indeed. I thought you knew only batting averages, Mr. Adam. I know all. <laughs> the Surprise Symphony by Joseph Haydn is correct. The next question comes to us from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, from Miss Dorothy Curtis. I'll read it for her. Here is a quotation from Rudyard Kipling. Give the next line. For a woman is only a woman, dot, 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 dot. Volunteers, Mr. Adams again, the bright boy of the class this evening. <laughs> but a good cigar is a smoke. Very good indeed. That is great. <laughs> Now, you've been so clever on Loxley Hall, I'm going to ask you what poem that comes from, Mr. Adams. We've won five dollars so far. Don't worry too much. <laughs> I don't know, but it begins, open the old cigar box. I didn't ask you that. <laughs> it comes from a poem, The Betroth, in case this ever comes up again next week or some other time. The Betroth. The, uh, 
next question will be read to us, invented by Mr. Wally Freed of Long Island. Mr. Freed. How is the immigration to the United States from the following nations restricted? England, Brazil, China. I'll repeat that question. How is immigration to the United States from the following nations restricted? England, Brazil, China. Do I see a look of intelligence on your face, Mr. Duffield? Doesn't look very intelligent to me, no. Don't see that question. I pass. You pass. (laughs) Anybody bid for a stage? Dr. Overstreet. I'm down. He's down. Dr. Jaffe, you follow my field. field. Now, Mr. Adams, you have no field. I didn't know there was any immigration. No immigration. (laughs) Looks very, very much to me as if I would have to ask the gentleman back here to ring up five dollars. Five dollars is going to Mr. Wally Freed of Long Island at this very moment. It's some sort of sauce that you boil along with oil. <laughs> what kind of fathead can be boiled in oil with impunity? Gentlemen, I'm going to give you ten seconds on that one. The head of a calf. I beg your pardon? C-A-L-F. C-A-L-F. No. I haven't got that down on my notes here. Must be wrong. What kind of fathead can be boiled in oil with impunity? That impunity is what stumps me. <laughs> Who let that fathead in here anyway? <laughs> no, no, Mr. Duffield. <laughs> Dr. Jaffe, it seems to me that ought to be in your line. You're a chemist. Are you calling me a fathead? No. <laughs> It seems to me that an atmosphere of general insult has already been established. <laughs> In order to pour oil with impunity on the troubled waters, I will now tell you that the kind of fathead that can be boiled in oil, thank you very much, is a fish named fathead to be found off the coast of California. <laughs> now, Mr. Gordon Kahn, who has just received... Uh, the sum of five dollars offers no explanation whatsoever of why these fatheads should stick around the coast of California rather than go any other place. Miss Fanny Berger of Brooklyn, New York, is here with a question. With what is each of the following expressions associated? Big four, big six, big ten. I'll repeat that question, a very good one. With what is each of the following expressions associated? Big four, big six, big ten. Mr. Adams again. A railroad. Uh, uh, what one are you referring to, Mr. Adams? The big a four. A railroad. Go ahead. The Topographical Union. For what one? Big six. Yeah. And big ten, I think I just saved the five dollars. I don't know. <laughs> Just save the five dollars by getting two out of three, you think. As a matter of fact, uh, Mr. Adams gets just just a slightly less than two out of three. We might let it go by, though. The big four represents a railroad train, a particular one on the Michigan Central. You admit that, don't you, Mr. Adams? No. You don't admit it. <laughs> this is no time for you and I to have a struggle. The big four ordinarily, however, is applied to the four principal statesmen at the World War Conference. Lloyd George, Orlando, Clement. I thought it was... so and Wilson. Otherwise, it may be applied to the railroad train on the Michigan Central, according to my note. If you don't admit that, we lose $5 and that glass of buttermilk. I thought it was the name of a railroad system. Big yeah. Railroad system. Railroad system. In that case, we'll let it go. And we'll have to adjudicate with uh, Miss Fanny Berger after the hour is over. Miss Fanny Berger, would you settle for two dollars and a half? <laughs> uh, now we have had. Uh, let me count up: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight questions. And I'd like to know how much in the whole our four remarkable experts have gotten. Uh, can the young lady in the back let us know? Can you let us know? <clears throat> According to this record, Mr. Jaffe, Mr. Duffield, Mr. Adams, and Dr. Overstreet, you have already lost us the sum of $12.50. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. 
for providing us to fix things up with Mr. Fanny Berger. If we can do things very well, if we can manage to strike some sort of bargain with her, we may be able to get away with the sum of a $10 loss. That's on eight credits. Now we have several to go. All the way from San Francisco, California, from Mr. John O'Brien, comes this query. Oh, this is a dandy. Mr. O'Brien has taken four lines of a verse you all know. Well, he assumes that. And rewritten them as follows. Can you quote the original? Now listen carefully, ladies and gentlemen. Rosii simplicifolia are rubric. Violi papilionastia are azurius. <laughs> Saccharose is dulcet. <laughs> and in a similar state are you. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, this is a real question, a real man reading it, though it sounds kind of peculiar, I know. Uh, gentlemen, do you want me to read that over again? We don't need it. No. Mr. Jaffe. Take it. Mr. Jaffe. I think that means roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet, and so are you. Very pretty. <laughs> Miss Jane Ellen of Locust Valley, Long Island, is here with a question. Can you, by examining tree stumps today, safely conclude that Aunt Minnie didn't have much use for her rubbers and umbrellas in 1904? <laughs> As a look of utter stupefaction on the faces of my four experts, I better repeat that question. Can you, by examining tree stumps today, safely conclude that Aunt Minnie didn't have much use for her rubbers and umbrellas in 1904. Dr. Overstreet. You can tell by the narrowness of the, uh, of the ring at a certain time, by counting back. Well, uh, how, how do you mean exactly? Well, you see, with a very rainy season, you have a, a wide uh, ring. With a very dry season, you have a narrow ring. Oh, I see. So you could count back, you and in that back. way, you learn what the right about hand one yeah, time. sure. That's quite true. <laughs> And, Dr. Overstreet, you'll agree with me, a very useful bit of information if you happen to have an Aunt Minnie who... Uh, right. And if she happens to want to know about the weather in 1904, you just examine tree stumps. Of course, if you have no Aunt Minnie, you're out of luck. If you have no tree stumps, oh, let's go on to the next question. Uh, the next question comes to us from Mr. Jack Lipman of Brooklyn, New York, who is here in person to deliver it. Chiasti Calio is a Greek island, a dictator of Peru, president of Finland or the name of the Japanese political party. I'll repeat that. Kiyosti Kalio, I'll spell that, K-Y-O-S-T-I, K-A-L-L-I-O, is a Greek island, a dictator of Peru, president of Finland, or the name of a Japanese political party. Volunteer. <laughs> You should see well, I can the say, Mr. Fatterman, it's Greek, Greek to me. It's Greek. <laughs> well, it's a Greek island, apparently, to Dr. Jaffe. Why, Mr. Adams, where's that customary alertness of yours? <laughs> Here it is. I don't know. <laughs> now, even if I uh, repeat the name, uh, again, you wouldn't know. Piasti Kalio is a Greek island, a dictator of Peru, president of Finland, or the name of a Japanese political party. President of Finland. How do you know, Mr. Duff? It's native-born intelligence. I think he's dead. <laughs> That's quite right. And it seems to me that any country that pays its debt is entitled to have a president with a name I can't pronounce. <laughs> so three cheers and a kiosti calio for the Republic of Finland. And we'll go on now to a question from Miss Mary Long of Tampa, Florida. I'll read that. Oh, I'm looking this over. Now, my jury of experts, would you mind very much if I directed the next question to Mr. Adams? Do you cede your rights in the next question? They cede their rights in the next question. Mr. Adams, you're an expert on popular songs, I believe. I am. And on popular tunes, I believe. And on popular. I hope you can answer this. Mr. Adams, can you sing the melody? <laughs> Mr. Adams, can you sing the melody to the following words taken from a well-known song? Now listen carefully. All round the little farm I wandered when I was young. 
Then many happy days I wandered, many the song I sung. Now, just before you, before you go ahead and sing that for us, I remember this. It is my duty, if you yeah, cannot do this, man. for me to do it, and I want you to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Adams. Go ahead. You asked me whether I could sing it? Yes. Can you sing the melody of the following words taken from a well-known song? That was a bluff. That's, that's the melody. Do it again for us. Sounds better and better. <laughs> The next question will be delivered by its inventor, Mr. Michael Abrams of New York City. Mr. Abrams. What present member of the cabinet occupies the same post that his father held under the Harding Coolidge administration? I'll repeat that question. What present member of the cabinet occupies the same post that his father held under the Harding Coolidge administration? I'll repeat that question. What present member of the cabinet occupies the same post that his father held under the Harding Coolidge administration? Mr. Duffield, our current event director. Duffield, our current event director. Duffield, our current director. And do you know what uh, his father's name was? Don't probe too deeply, Mr. Fadden. No, we won't. <laughs> <laughs> well, it so happens that his father's name was Henry II. Obviously, the Wallaces haven't moved on much, just back where they started from. The next question is will be delivered by uh, Miss Edith Schick of Washington Heights, New York. Miss Schick. Why should eating have reminded George Washington of lumber? Miss Schick, you're perfectly serious about that, aren't you? <laughs> Why should eating have reminded George Washington of lumber? Why, two of them know it. Mr. Jaffe. Why, it's common knowledge, I think, that George Washington had a set of teeth, false teeth made of wood. Very good. That's, That's correct. That's correct. <laughs> Jaffe, do you suppose that's how we get the expression with tooth and nail, possibly? <laughs> well, now we've had uh, 15 questions. And I think we ought to have a recapitulation. See how much we've lost. Still $10? Doing very well indeed. Only $10 out. We have $90 to get that buttermilk with. <laughs> the next question comes all the way from Kansas City, Missouri, from Mr. Bill Wilson. Now, I'll tell you what worries Mr. Bill Wilson. Listen carefully, gentlemen. If the North Star ceased giving light at 10 o'clock tonight, would it be apparent to anyone looking for it at 11 o'clock, an hour later, without the aid of telescopes? Mr. Adam shakes his head. <laughs> Mr. Jaffe. The answer is uh, no. What? Light would still be visible because the light that has left the North Star has been on its way to the Earth for many thousands of years. Well, that is an exaggeration, but I believe that the answer no is correct. We couldn't see it at 11 o'clock. It takes only 47 years for the light of the North Star to reach the Earth. Practically instantaneous. <laughs> <laughs> That's the correct answer. We have to wait an awfully, awfully long time before we uh, knew when the North Star ceased giving light. Why don't you ask him to sing the North Star? There's no fear. <laughs> Adams is kidding me. <laughs> uh, Miss Olga Gordon of Brooklyn, New York, is here with a question. Miss Gordon? Will you identify the authors of each of the following? First, one that loved not wisely but too well. Second, my own dear love, he is all my heart, and I wish somebody'd shoot him. <laughs> I'll repeat that. Will you identify the authors of each of the following? One, one that loved not wisely but too well. Two, my own dear love, he is all my heart, and I wish somebody'd shoot him. Now, we have to answer both of those. Mr. Adams, both of them, both of them. I can't answer both of them. Can you answer one of them? Yes, sir. Which one? The latter. Well, I expected you to answer the former. Now you confuse the entire proceedings of the whole evening. <laughs> all right, Mr. Adams, let's have the latter. The latter was written by Dorothy Parker. That's correct. Uh, you don't know uh, who wrote One That Loved Not Wisely But Too Well? No. Cash register. Five dollars is going now to be deposited in the palm of Miss Alga Gordon of Brooklyn, New York. 
Now, let's see if between, uh, rather among the four of us, we can't scare off the author of the perfectly well-known quotation. At least I know it now, looking upon my card. Uh, one that loved not wisely, but too well. I'll bet on Mr. Shakespeare. Mr. Shakespeare is correct. <laughs> now, Mr. Duffy, if you'd only have the good sense to whisper what you knew to Mr. Adams, and if he had whispered what he knew to you, perhaps you might have saved that five dollars. I scorn such methods. <laughs> <laughs> They're pretty fake, do you? <laughs> All right, if you scorn such methods, let's see what you can do with this question. This uh, will uh, be delivered by Miss Sophie Lane of New York. Miss Lane? What sextet sang their way to fame recently? I get that clearly, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> what sextet sang their way to fame recently? Unfurrow that brow, Dr. Overstreet. <laughs> Search me. Search me. What sextet sang their way to fame recently, Mr. Adams? You know all about sextets. I know about sextets, but I don't know what recently means. Re- you don't know what recently means. <laughs> <laughs> they will lose $5 if you don't know what recently means. It means a little while ago. I think I... <laughs> Dr. Chappie thinks he knows. I think I can answer it. Yes? Is uh, the question of referring to the seven dwarfs? That's correct, the seven dwarfs. <laughs> now, now, Mr. Johnson, I'm going to ask you to explain what you mean. You remember the question referred to a sex test. Well, one of them was Dopey. <laughs> <He didn't... laughs> and don't look at Mr. Adams when you say that. <laughs> <laughs> now, the uh, next question will be given to us by Mr. Irving Mansfield of New York City, who is here in person to deliver it. Mr. Mansfield. Who is the only president of the United States born west of the Mississippi River? I think we ought to get that. Who was the only president of the United States born west of the Mississippi River? Mr. Herbert Hoover. Mr. Herbert Hoover is correct. <laughs> well, I'm afraid that's all the questions we have time for tonight. And now I'll ask Mr. Claney to give us the total penalties against the board, which remain at how much? Uh, $20, Mr. Adams. $20 lost. $20 lost out of the kitty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Claney. Thank you, all members of the board and all the folks that have submitted questions. And now I think Mr. Claney has a word for you about next week's contest. Until then, good night, everybody. Mr. Fadiman, we meet again next week at 8.30 for another quiz contest between the public and the experts. The panel board for next week will include Dr. Paul DeCrife, famous author of Microbe Hunters, and more recently, The Fight for Life. Lewis Hacker, noted historian and economist of the staff of Columbia University. Franklin P. Adams and Marcus Duffield, day news editor of the Herald Tribune. Send us your questions and answers, as many as you can think of. There are no restrictions on the number you may submit. If they are chosen for presentation to the board, you will receive $2 apiece and five additional dollars if they prove to be stumpers. All questions become the property of information, please, and are not returnable. Questions on all subjects are welcome. History, sports, literature, music, science, movies, and so forth. The tougher the questions, the better the experts will like them. But don't ask them to explain the theory of relativity in ten seconds flat or why Greta Garbo wants to be alone. Join our new game of quizzing the experts. Send your questions to Information, Please, to the National Broadcasting Company, New York City. Until next Tuesday evening at 8.30, good night. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Information, Please. Wake up, Mr. and Mrs. America. Time to stump the experts. The battle royal between the public and the experts is on again in which the much-quizzed public turn the tables and quiz the experts. In this new national pastime, you get the opportunity to try and flunk the professors who have always tried to flunk you. Sounds good, doesn't it? Well, to make the revenge taste even sweeter, if you succeed in flunking the experts, you will be rewarded with a five... Ten seconds flat... Or why Greta Garbo wants to be alone. 
Join our new game of quizzing the experts. Send your questions to information, please, to the National Broadcasting Company, New York City. Until next Tuesday evening at 8.30, good night. This is the National Broadcasting Company.